Yeah, hi guys. Let's just look here. Um, I make a video earlier talking about um, well, explaining what my ideas on what gravity is and what gravity could be really. And the thought was that um, all atoms at a certain frequency vibrate at a certain all 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 atoms vibrate at a certain frequency, and all atoms or electrons, protons behave like um behave like gyroscopes. So what if the gyroscopic and the vibration effect of the atom created a force that that um created an inertial force that forced matter down to the ground. So that um that can explain when you throw something up it falls straight down to the ground. I'm gonna show a series of videos I think it's two sets of videos showing um demonstrating that um that gyroscopes or gyroscopic motion could be what gravity really is so watch the videos and write in comments let me know what you all think I confess it's some time since I read Alice Through the Looking Glass before preparing for these lectures, and I'd certainly forgotten the words of the nonsense rhyme about the Jabberwock. So, to begin with, I'm going to ask Alice herself, in the form of Louise, if she will bring us up to date and read us the first two verses of the nonsense rhyme. Twas brillig, and the slithy toves stood gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borogoves, and the mome raths sat grave. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jab jab bird and shun the frumious bandersnatch. Thank you, Alice. <laughs> gyre and gimbal in the way. Gyre and gimbal are the words that invite us to study gyroscopes in gimbal rings. Gyroscopes like this, beautiful. Victorian gyro, all with its own weights and contraptions. I'm going to spin it and immediately ask a volunteer to come and give it a push. So first of all, I'll spin. Now, someone come and just put your finger on this little button here and push towards me very gently. Again, keep pushing. Thank you. It didn't yield to her push, you see. It it will go either way. It did something different. Now we call that something different precession. And I shall have a lot more to say about precession in a few minutes. <coughs> the Jabberwock was a monster with many heads. It was as if it was for me a representative of the way we divide our science into physics, chemistry, biology, and then we take one of those, like physics, and we divide it into heat, light, sound, electricity, and magnetism. Then we subdivide that, and so on. Now, some of these heads of the Jabberwock uh, are really laws of physics, I suppose, for me. And some of them look into mirrors and see their own reflections. And they then think there are more of their kind than there really are. The same can probably, from an engineering point of view, be said about the so-called fundamental particles. They try to coexist with each other. Now, the idea of science, in rather perhaps the profession of science, uh, as a monster, is not a new one. Uh, Martin Gardner, my favourite author, put, a neat, put it in a neat way in a chapter on the fall of parity. And we talked about parity last time and said that parity was to do with the universe as a whole being handed, having a preference for left or right handedness without saying which. 
and Martin Gardner wrote this. Not one of the three experiments that first toppled parity would have been performed at the time it was performed if Li and Yang had not told the experimentalists what to do. Li had no experience whatever in the laboratory. Yang had worked very briefly in a lab at the University of, <coughs> sorry, University of Chicago where he was once a kind of assistant to the great Italian physicist Enrico Fermi. He had not been happy in experimental work. His associates had even made up a short rhyme about him which Bernstein reports. Where there's a bang, there's Yang. <laughs> Laboratory bangs, went on Martin Gardner, can range all the way from an exploding test tube, or in our case, a Mr. Coates special, <laughs> to the explosion of a hydrogen bomb. But the really big bangs, went on Martin Gardner, are the bangs that occur in the heads of theoretical physicists when they try to put together the pieces handed to them by experimental physicists. Hmm. One of the things that you may not have been made sufficiently aware of is that there is apparently no simple connection between gravitational mass and inertial mass. When you compare two masses, you can do it either by weighing each on the same spring balance or by subjecting each to a known force and measuring its acceleration. And the two methods always agree in the answers absolutely. And so, although there's no simple connection, these two heads of the monster must in some way be a curious kind of reflection, the one from the other. Now in the Jabberwock nonsense rhyme, Lewis Carroll invented some lovely new words, especially for me, slithy and mimsy. They were explained later as combinations of other words which allowed him to express two ideas at once. Lithe and slimy gave rise to slithy. Miserable and flimsy gave rise to mimsy. Now, engineers have been employing this word combination idea for some time, and at first I must say that the words were scorned by the pure scientists because they didn't describe anything that was quantifiable. You couldn't measure it, so it didn't exist. That is a philosophy of its own. But one of the useful ones, which has now become respectable, I will demonstrate to you with the help of four blocks of metal on a nicely polished plane surface. And I am going to tilt the plane and see whether all the blocks slide off together as the good book of applied mechanics tells us they should. When the angle of the plane, oh dear, there's one gone already. When the angle of the plane reaches the angle of friction, they should all slide together. But I'm afraid they don't. And if you want to repeat this experiment, you'll have to polish the plane very carefully and clean the blocks. Now, the angle of friction determines the coefficient of friction. Uh, last lecture, I promised you jam tomorrow. Jam you shall have. And tomorrow you shall say we had jam yesterday. Robbery jam. Now we will do an experiment in friction. Mm. I can see myself getting into trouble with some of your mums when, when you get home and start doing this. Now let us see what uh, the good mechanics book has to say about the laws of friction. <laughs> That's gone the friction was increased. Mu had a bigger value. Mu for that one has a very large value. <coughs> <laughs> Mu equals, uh, ooh, nearly, you know, the, the lot. Nearly infinity. The angle of friction is now 90 and Mu is infinity. We can handle infinity. But what about more than infinity? Now you know what's going to happen. After a while, they're going to peel themselves slowly off the goo and drop. And you see that you made the difficulty for yourselves by defining a coefficient of friction such that if they stuck on the vertical, the coefficient of friction was infinity. A lot of rubbish. The engineer knows what he's doing. He knows what's going on. And it is the job of the engineer to interpret science. You mustn't let it get too pure that it becomes a nonsense. And as far as I'm concerned, I go along with Humpty Dumpty. When I use a word, said Humpty Dumpty, 
It means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. And so say I with emphasis. For after what I thought to be a clear exposition of a subject in this theatre last November, my use of the conservation of momentum principle was interpreted as a claim to have created momentum out of nothing. How anyone with a PhD could get that wrong, I cannot imagine, but when the journalistic editor got at it, the headline was something like, Newton was wrong, says Professor. The professor said nothing of the kind. But from then it's a short step to perpetual motion, energy creation from nowhere, and half the crackpots in the kingdom are writing to me, solving the world's energy crisis. <laughs> it's like the whispering game at a party. After that follows the slings and arrows. You have no idea. And talking of crackpots, Freeman Dyson made these comments in an article in the Scientific American. Most of the crackpot papers which are submitted to the Physical Review are rejected, not because it is impossible to understand them, but because it is possible. Those which are impossible to understand are usually published. <laughs> <laughs> In the same article, he wrote of a lecture in New York by Pauli to a group of scientists that included no less a person than Niels Bohr. In the discussion that followed the talk, younger scientists were sharply critical of Pauli. Bohr rose to speak. We are all agreed, he said to Pauli, that your theory is crazy. The question which divides us is whether it is crazy enough to have a chance of being correct. Now, circularity is a powerful concept. In circular motion, there is magic, as there is in that other thing we call electromagnetism. But like that subject, it is not, the magic is not apparent until it is like, shall we say, rather than its reflection, it's like its neighboring head, truly three-dimensional. A coil of wire, in 1830, was said to have a property all its own, which was called resistance. This was a property of this coil. You could measure it by measuring the ratio of the voltage across it to the current flowing in it. So I will pass some DC into the coil. Sorry, I beg your pardon. Yes, will. Pass AC into this coil. Uh, we've got about five amps of it, have we? No, less than that. We want some more. That's it. About five amps of that, yeah. And then we can use a second coil merely connected to a voltmeter. When I put this second coil on the top, it gets some induced voltage by a mechanism which I do not understand, and I suspect that neither does anyone else. But if I turn this second coil at right angles, it's always been our experience, you can find a place where the voltage is zero, as long as the coils remain at right angles. It's as if they lived in separate worlds and didn't want to know about each other. Now, in that respect, I was reminded by a drawing by M.C. Escher, who's done many marvellous drawings, that it was like the drawing of the men on the staircase. And of them, the artist himself said, here we have three forces of gravity working perpendicular to one another. Here is an artist being more of a scientist than we are ourselves. Three earth planes, he said, cut across each other at right angles, and human beings are living on each of them. It is impossible for the inhabitants of different worlds to walk or sit or stand on the same floor because they have different conceptions of what is horizontal and what is vertical. Yet they may well share the use of the same staircase. On the top staircase, illustrated here, two people are moving side by side and in the same direction and yet one of them is obviously going downstairs and the other upstairs. Contact between them is out of the question because they live in two different worlds and therefore can have no knowledge of each other's existence. They remind me sometimes of a chemist and an engineer. <laughs> Although the artist has only used a trick of perspective to influence the mind of the observer, it is a lively, healthy influence indeed for me. Gyroscopes are essentially circular things. A scientific gyro is usually mounted in gimbal rings. It's 
So that there is the wheel. Here is the inner ring. Here is the outer ring. All three sets of pivots, that the, the axes pass through the center of mass of the gyro. Now I will tell you what precession is. A torque, by the way, is a twisting force. Instead of push, which is a force, you push a thing which is pivoted and it twists. So torque is a twisting force. The result of the twisting force is a movement, a rotation, but not in the axis in which you applied the torque. And we call that precession. So I push, I put a torque on the outer ring, it is the inner that precesses. I put a torque on the inner ring, it is the outer that precesses. It will work in either direction. Oh, you're cheating, I can hear my critics saying. You're pulling it round as well as doing that. All right, we will uh, satisfy the critics. We will hang a weight from the inner ring so that gravity and not I shall put on the torque. And there you see a precession. Not the sort of movement you really expected because you are accustomed in higher mathematics to a torque producing an acceleration. Here, a torque produces purely a rotation. And if I put three times the mass on, I get three times the angular velocity. A different sort of device from our common experience. Now, what I want you to notice this time is, I'll spin it up again because it's getting a little slow. I want you to notice how it accelerates when I put the weight on and how it decelerates, especially how it decelerates. Having been convinced that a torque produces a velocity and not an acceleration, it must have an acceleration or it couldn't increase its velocity at all. And it must have a deceleration when it stops. So let us see if you can determine the rate of deceleration from that sort of angular velocity. When it comes round, I'm going to catch the weight and watch it stop. Hop. Ready again? Hop. There is an acceleration, but it is of a simply enormous value. Let us try increasing the torque by increasing the radius at which things happen. I put this long arm on and of course it will precess anyway now because of the uh, out of balance mass there but I can now hang a weight on there and the precession rate increases because the radius has increased and if I hang it on further along I get a still bigger precession rate. If I hang it right at the end you'll see it do something else besides merely go around at constant speed. I think I need a fresh spin. Hang on. Incidentally, this shaft has a peg in it. When you buy a toy gyroscope, it has a hole in it. The first thing to do when you've bought a toy gyro is to fill the hole in with a peg that sticks out because you break the string in a hole and you never do from a peg. Right, we'll reinsert the torque arm. Come on. Yes. When it comes round, I'm going to hang this weight on and I'm going to let it drop rather fiercely. You see it going up and down as it goes around? That process is called nutation. It is the result of an, an acceleration as well as a pure precession. Now, the two worlds. The fact that I can press on that and produce a precession of that, either way, has got nothing to do with the fact that I can press on that and produce a precession that way. Because I can hang a weight on this side, and at the same time, I can then attempt to make it go faster than it was going before by pushing on there, just like our volunteers. And you see, the weight comes up or down. Now we've got something new because a weight rising means an increase in potential energy. Where did the energy come from? That's what it came from my finger. 
because now my finger was moving as it pushed. When I pushed on it and it was stationary, it didn't yield at all, so there was no power input. And even though there's movement of the inner ring, there's no power output because that moves without being capable of producing any torque. If I resist that motion, then of course it immediately gives way to me. So these are the two worlds separated for you as they never are in electromagnetism. We have again been able to make the invisible visible to dare to make the intangible tangible. Now, scientific gyros are beautiful things like this in gymberings that maintain their axis of spin, but the real magic lay in the toy gyroscope, the one you've seen come down the string. Toy gyros are usually supplied with a little Eiffel Tower model, and one of the standard tricks you're supposed to do is to spin the gyro, put it sideways on the tower, thus allowing the force of gravity down on that to be reacted by a normal force from the top of the tower. So you're putting a torque on about a horizontal axis and that will make the gyro precess about a vertical axis and everyone is amused. And no one takes it seriously because it is, after all, a toy, isn't it? Fine. Most interesting demonstration. Uh, let us just weigh these two things. First of all, we will weigh the gyroscope. Where's the old there? That's it. We will weigh the gyro, and we find it to be 310 grams. That's 312 grams. We will weigh the tower and find it to be <coughs> less than a gram. So, over 300 times the weight of the tower. Now, haven't we missed something? Thank you, Bill. What did we miss? We missed the fact that if you ever try to rotate something which is eccentric, not symmetrical, you tend to... Yeah, somebody knows, they've tried. <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> you tend to shake your bones to pieces. Sure. <laughs> now, what is happening when I do that? Apart from me getting in terrible shaking, the whole of this is trying to retain its centre of mass fixed. Let us look at the gyro again with that sort of thought in mind. Surely, 300 grams compared to 1 gram, you would expect the 300 grams to want to stay in the same place, and you'd expect it to move the tower around itself. But of course it is our common experience that although that happens, the gyro on the tower does not make the tower go round the gyro. 300 times the mass, whoops, sorry about that. Can you screw back in his bearing? Friction on the table. I can hear my critics now. He has friction. We thought we would uh, remove as much of the friction as we could by spinning it on ice. Oh, it's come off the tower bill. Right. We estimate that the coefficient of friction between the tower and the ice is about 0 0.02, which is just about as small as one could expect to get without going to something exotic. Uh, it's a little bit tight on the bearing, man. Could you give me the fly? Did you do it up with your fingers? Yeah. Oh, it's all right, I can manage. Just a wee bit tight on the pivot. Ah, thank you. This, of course, is an adjustable gyro. This belongs to an earlier age. Nowadays, they make the flywheels out of aluminium, and what better metal than something that's uh, one of the lightest we know for making a flywheel? So, there it is. This is the modern uh, high standard of living. This is an old-fashioned gyro, about 30, 40, 50 years ago. We have some gyros here today that are 100 years old. So here's a thought. This thing has been with us for a hundred years, and we haven't noticed those things which we might have noticed. A tower on ice.
Are you convinced? I was. Now, this is something that needs following up. And following up means getting a little more scientific and, in particular, making it a bit bigger so that friction has less effect. A gyroscope that can move about a vertical axis, and when I undo this clamp, it has the freedom to drop as well. It is a more sophisticated model of our gyro on the tower. Let us spin this one up and see what happens. beauty. You can see a little mutation taking place. I can do the trick I did with the two worlds. I can make it rise up by pushing it a little faster. Notice the precessional speed now is very large because the torque is very large because the gyro is offset a long way. Now, suppose I'd clamped that there and tried to rotate it at that same speed. Watch what happens. Why did it topple? I can't get up to anything like the speed I should do before it wants to take off. It appears to exhibit no centrifugal force. Suppose we were to take this gyro out and put it in a box so that you couldn't see that there was something in the box that was spinning. I'm going to spin it up, put it in the box that you can't see, and then we'll weigh it, and then we'll put it back on there, and we'll ask a question. There are quite things to handle these when they're moving. Put him on the balance. And he weighs about 30 ounces, nearly two pounds. We put him on the machine. Can you tighten up the nut, Bill? Thank you. Unclump the middle. There is a black box containing you know not what. And I give it a push. The other way. There it goes. I pushed it round. There's a two pound mass with a real angular velocity and no angular momentum. No angular momentum except from the dead weight. It's not rotating. Because if I want to stop it, there's no energy required to stop it, no energy release, because I didn't give it any when I began. Let us go one stage further with this to something bigger, something more scientific we can make. We go to this machine, which has little buckets around the outside, so that I can uh, blow air on them and get it spinning to a, a quite high speed. Uh, something like uh, 5,000 revs a minute. Don't be alarmed by the noise. When we get this eight pound wheel up to speed, I shall take a pin out there to allow it to flop like this. And then we shall do experiment number one, which is to search for centrifugal force. If I bring out the gyro to that position, it is free to topple over. I shall need, in fact, a little weight to hold it down. Of course, in any other position, it's all right. It's only when the offset mass comes out there that it weighs over like that. Now, we'll spin this up, and then I'll take the weight off and ask Mr. Coates to catch the gyro as it falls. Come around there and ready to catch it when I lift the weight. Next time around it's coming off. <laughs> he cheated again, says the man in the gallery. Did he really? Yes, he pushed the aluminium back a bit. All right, he'll pull it forward a bit. 
more than a bit. Pull it forward a lot. The whole of the tower is now well outside the end of the bench. And if you want me to prove it, I'll show you what happens when the wheel is stationary. Again, it doesn't require much catching, you see. It's gentle as a lamb. Now we'll put the pin back in, and we'll see by how much it overbalances. Well, a lot, obviously. How much? That much? Oh, a lot more than that. That much? More than that. That's it. That much? Over two kilograms. Out of balance. And if that looks a ridiculous thing to do, I'm going to spin it up again and then turn it upside down. Quite a brute to take upside down. Thank you very much. There we are. <laughs> when you have seen that, you have seen something you have not seen before. Again, there was the same out of balance, two kilograms. These gyros are getting larger, and of course, like electrical machines, as they get larger, they get better. Now, what was very interesting about that experiment, I'm about to show you. I'm going to modify this gyro by putting in a second pivot point. I screw that into there, and then the gyro into the end, and now the gyro has two alternative pivots. It can either pivot about there or about there. Okay? Which do you think it will elect to do? Bill? The gyro always knows the answer do that. It's never going to stay out there, is it? It'd be stupid to expect it to stay out there. Stupid, was it? Well, what about that one? Let's just have a look at what we've just done. The last thing I did was to take a gyro with a pivot there, another pivot there, and then the wheel. And we found that, of course, it elected for that to come down there like that, and the gyro to stick out there, because by doing so, there was no change in the axis to spin the gyro, no precession necessary. Why then did that work? Because there is a bench overhung. Here was an aluminium plate. The tower was completely outside the end of the table. A pivot there. The wheel there. And the second pivot there. This thing had the the ability, if it wished, to do this and still remain with the gyro horizontal. Why did it not make use of the ability to go like that with the tower there and the gyro still horizontal? We shall see. This is the most remarkable experiment I think that I've ever done. I'll balance that, first of all, like a seesaw. So there is a balance point. When I take this out here, of course, then the balance point is uh, upset. It should tip down. We know that given the opportunity, it's going to do this if it can, but now we've balanced it and we've balanced it about its centre of mass. 
So that if this gyro transfers its mass centre to the pivot, it should stay balanced. The question is, will it? Let those who say I cannot make a body appear lighter than it is come and pull holes in that one. We shall proceed from larger gyros to still larger gyros. And this one, Bill, I think it was. This one weighs getting on for 15, 16 pounds. And uh, we've got some spots on it so you can see its speed. And we're going to anchor it from the roof, chain it like a dog. They get rather big. Now I'm going to put a retort stand under what I believe to be the centre of support. It's a bit difficult when the thing doesn't float. It's right this way. How's it this way? It's about. It gives you a general guide as to where the pivot point is. Right, old Bill. Spin her up. When he hands this one to me, it's quite a handful. It has a mind of its own, and you want to turn it round, it says it wants to go back. There's a lot of energy in this wheel. Now, we are now giving it hardly any fetters whatever. It's only tethered to the roof, it's got no gimbal rings, it can go any way it pleases, it must surely want to rotate with its centre of mass over the point, under the point of support. The jabber what isn't the only monster. Over the centre of mass, over the centre of support, there it goes. What will it do? <laughs> 2001, a space odyssey. No less. Note <laughs> Notice the angle it makes with the horizontal. It's tipped down a bit. In a moment, you'll see it rise again. Now it's coming in on a shorter orbit, and the wheel axis is now beginning to tilt upwards. It is going to maintain its centre of mass on a horizontal plane even though as a conical pendulum it appears to have raised. Now it's actually going out again. And it will perform a number of these orbits from an outermost orbit to an innermost and it reminds one of an electron and it reminds one of an electron jumping from orbit to orbit because they're said to spin also. If we have the patience we'll see it come in again and rise up again and the gyro wheel is slowing by its own pivot friction and it is remarkable how low a speed you can get and still have the gyro staying horizontal when it gets close in. It is liable to get settled into a very definite orbit like this which is the time when I move in and say is he going back? You think it'll do it itself? It seems we've got rather settled. I'll just disturb it a trifle. Come on. I didn't disturb it enough. Go in. No. I wanted him to do. No, he won't do it now. I'll have to help him. He's running down, he's running very slowly. But what is surprising, you begin to see the spots now because he's only running very slowly and I'm going to slow it still more because of our lack of time. Slow it right down so you can really see those spots and then say, will you still maintain that that shall be your axis of spin? And he says, yes, of course. 
Look at the rotational speed. It'll soon be down to the stage it's doing one revolution of precession per revolution of the rotor. And that is a most incredible machine. Something that you can try on a small scale with a toy gyro like this. Don't ever attempt it with this size because uh, it is very lethal indeed. So would you like to uh, kill that one? Right, we go from bigger to bigger still. This time I call for a volunteer. I shouldn't if I were you. I've got a very specially trained astronaut for this. Come on, Dennis. Here's our ch chest defeating champion, beating the masters once again. When we stand him on here, I can turn him around with this handle from here. I can spin him around on that platform. So they're going to strap him in very, very tightly. Waist and shoulders. All right. And then we're going to spin up the biggest gyro of the day, which is here. This weighs 18 pounds. The shaft weighs six pounds. Would some strong fella like to come and try his strength? Try lifting that up with both hands at one end like that. Who's going to try? Come on. <laughs> All right, grab hold of the end. Okay. Whoa. <laughs> Heavier than you thought, isn't it? Yep. Try again. Now do it with both hands at one end. <laughs> You're never going to make it, much. Right. Now, we're going to give this to Dennis when we've spun it up to about 2,000 revs a minute. And he's going to show you his feats of strength. Okay. Right. Nice and easy. Nice and easy first, Dennis. Take a good hold, that's it. Yeah. Get your hand further back, Dennis. You got it. Your hand further back. Pull your hands in. Slow it down. I can make him lower it. Or raise it. Look at that. Put your arms out, Dennis, if you can. <laughs> I'm going to shake this young man by the hand. He's got more courage than I ever had at his age. <laughs> because he knew... Now it's over, I can tell you, he knew that if he dropped that, it had enough energy that getting a good grip from the ground, it could have hurled itself 200 feet in the air. That was what he held. I'm doing this to warn you against doing demonstrations. We'll do that after this. I think it's more relevant. Can you bring in the... We're going to spin up a small gyro here. Up to about the same speed as we had with that, about 5,000 RPM. And then, spin it up with an airline. And then I'm going to drop it deliberately onto a rubber mat. Just to show you how much energy there is in that little thing there. And then you can imagine what that one had. Um, <laughs> Get it nice and flat against the car. Up a bit. Okay. Uh, Mr. Coates is going to try to catch it in a butterfly net. I had to bring butterflies in some way. Uh, right. Okay. Okay.
Before we put your lives in danger, we tried it last night with a lot more revs. We got it about half the height of the theatre coming somewhere over there. There are large amounts of energy at stake here. Now, we'll try this big one again on a stand. On this stand, there is a spring. On top of the spring, you have a bearing which is free to rotate that way, or a linear bearing to make it go up and down. And we are going to couple this wheel into a pivot. And once again, spin it up with the drill, sorry. Tighten up. Now this looks as if it's going to overbalance for sure. Okay. Right? Ready? If you're careful, before the noise starts, as it rises, if I push it round, you should be able to see the spring lift. Okay. 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 It's going to go very fast. No centrifugal force. I can make it rise, and as I do so, that spring says it weighs less. It looks a monstrous device with all that energy that I told you about to have to catch with one hand. It's no problem at all. It has no angular momentum this way. I can lean down all too casually and stop it. It is, as I said, as gentle as a lamb. I didn't give it any energy, so why should I expect to receive any from it? Okay, then. Cool that one down. Are these discoveries new? Well, not entirely. I have had letters from all kinds of people who have done similar experiments before and for one reason or another have given up for one, lack of know-how and scientific background, two, lack of money and workshop facilities, three, lack of courage, <laughs> four, lack of anyone to listen, especially four. Now today I've got all of you here ready to listen. What a pleasure it is to talk to young people who are ready to listen after you've talked to adults. Quite the most amazing letter I had was from a man who wrote quite unemotionally that he'd performed some of the experiments that I'd done some ten years ago. And he knew that they worked, but he added, I've not told any of my colleagues or friends because even though I occupy quite a senior post in the scientific civil service, I still have a few years to go to retirement and I still cherish hopes of further promotion. <laughs> That is a hell of a thing to say in the scientific world, isn't it? This man dare not tell his colleagues. We talk about blackbirds pecking out the white feathers of their colleagues or killing them if they can't because they didn't conform. This man is afraid of being put away because he wouldn't conform. Now this is not the time or place to go into the mathematics of the gyros. This I can do also. It is not the place to attempt an explanation of the phenomenon but I cannot send you away hungry, you who have come to listen and to learn. I'm going to go back to an electrical experiment. In this theatre, someone said, Mr. Faraday, what use is all this? And he was my personal hero. He was the man who showed that Ohm's law was only all right for DC. I'm using this coil again. You put DC through it from a battery and you get 4 amps and 8 volts. That coil has a property all its own which we call resistance, Ohm's law. And with 8 volts and 4 amps you get 2 ohms. Now we'll apply some alternating current 
to the same coil and we'll get our same four amps. Uh, you got the wrong scale on, Benny. And you put the scale right. We're not cheating. You can try this for yourself. This is obviously well known. The voltage is in fact 32. So now we have four amps and 32 volts and we have apparently eight ohms. We call them ohms, but they're not in ohms law. Ohm's law can't have two different values at the same time. The interesting thing is that over 140 years later, we don't say that Ohm's law was wrong. We simply say it is restricted to the use of DC. So however distasteful it is, we now have to say that object has got something more than a mass. It's got a mass so long as, and a mass only, so long as we want to push it about in straight lines weigh it, accelerate it, so on. But if we ever choose to spin it, it has another property, all of its own, which corresponds to the inductance of a coil. This is the updating of Newton's laws of motion. But I'm not saying that Newton's laws of motion are wrong. I'm merely pointing out they are restricted to motion in straight lines and to motion where there is no rate of change of acceleration just as there was no rate of change of current for Ohm's law. So, that is at least some food for you to think about and some indication that I have very strong ideas as to how these things work. So, I find no difficulty in saying this thing in a black box had a mass, an angular velocity and no angular momentum because we know that in a reactive circuit you have volts, amps and no watts. What is so difficult at that? And if the abominable no men outside this theatre, this is one of the letters I received, a man called my critics ab abominable no men. They say no before they've even watched. Uh, this eight pound gyro, we're going to spin it up to a speed that'll give about one revolution per second of precession. Have we got the bit of wood, by the way? Okay, I'll try and remember the note. Right that is about one revolution per second. I'm going to stick a peg in a hole and it did not break off the peg because it had no momentum. Now I can tell you that at that speed the same effect can be obtained if I tilt the gyro to 45 degrees, pin it, put it to 45 degrees and then let it drop. Okay, watch it from the shadow. Didn't, didn't break off the peg, I didn't put it in hard enough. 45 degrees, it should have broken, it did this morning. I think you can see there's a much bigger blow effected on it than there was when it was rotating. That's the only loser I've had this afternoon, not them bad. That also you could try for yourselves on a smaller gyro. No, I have not invented perpetual motion, of course not. So neither of the scores of people who've written to me saying that they did it before me. Leonardo da Vinci had a picture of a machine like this to dismiss it for all time, that it was impossible. But nobody listened. Leonardo knew all about this. This machine was a perpetual motion machine reinvented throughout centuries. That ball is supposed to roll down that slot, and by increasing its torque and increased radius, it's supposed to bring the next ball in line, and so on, and so on. A perpetual motion machine. Gyroscopes, spinning tops, Perpetual motion. Any connection, do you think? Let's try this one. You can see why they cherish coach, can't you? It takes a long time to settle down, but it would never work. Neither would this one. This is just another 
reenactment of the same sort of thing, you hope that when that flips over, like that, it'll give enough inertia to bring the next one over and so on. So once given a start, it should just go on. Not a very good invention. <laughs> but in Switzerland, they really believe in flywheels, gyros. They drive buses with them. They drive buses around up hill and down dale for half a day at a time. There is a Swiss bus, and there is a picture of the gyroscope, or the, the flywheel, inside the bus. Look at the size of it compared with the man standing alongside. Enough energy to drive a bus for half a day. And unlike the internal combustion engine, when it goes downhill, it effectively pours petrol back into the tank. You see, in Switzerland, they have lots of ups and downs, and if they're going to have use all the petrol getting up and then have nothing to come back, the flywheel will absorb the energy on the way down. Our little fellow here has done very well, isn't he? You know, it's a perpetual motion machine. I mean, uh, how long do you think we'd have to wait for that top to stop? Well, I can tell you, you would have to wait five and a half days and nights. You can see there's something rather odd going on, can't you? Inside there, there's a whole box of electronics. There's a little mica chip with six transistors on it. There's an electromagnet in the center. There's a, dete a metal detecting device. And underneath the top, there's a little bit of steel. And when it gets near the center, the metal detecting device shouts, hey, he's coming, and the electromagnet switches on. And the clever bit is this raised exclamation mark you can see, I think, in the monitor. Because the underside of the top is so shaped that when it's pulled in against that exclamation mark, it runs along it and it gives it, as it were, a lash from a whip. So it's very like the old-fashioned whip and top idea. And of course, the top will keep going just as long as there is energy for the electromagnet. And for one very small pocket lamp battery, that will run five and a half days. <laughs> That's a nice story indeed. But if you really want to see... <laughs> our gyro really processes, then we've made one which, in which the rim has been subdivided into a lot of little masses on spring wires, so that when I set it in motion, turn it to the, to the camera, you can see this. If I now waggle it side to side, the inner ring that is, you can see the precession taking place not about the point you thought, not about the midpoint here, but about the top and bottom. And if I give the inner ring a spin, you can see this leaning over like a dinner plate. Can you see that? Incidentally, I said that when you had a gyro going, it wanted to maintain its actions to spin. Why isn't that stopping them? And if I let go, it wasn't what the other gyros did. There's one point to think about. I'll answer that next time. Thank you, Bill. There is much, much experimenting to be done. I've only tried offset gyros like that. Relatively simple. What about this one? I counterbalance the mass of the gyro here so that I've got gyro axis, precession axis, and torque axis. Only the torque and rotor axis meet. And then you can go one stage further and have three axes. Sorry, that wasn't the one. That's that one. That one has all three axes, skew lines in space. That, torque axis, axis of rotor, all missing one another. What might that do? And we haven't yet started taking energy out of the rotor, which is what an electrical engineer would call radiation. All this and more must be done. Even the mathematics is not beyond A level. The subject is so new, although it's 100 years old, the seas are so uncharted, I've only had time to make replicas of those. Edward de Bono encourages us to do lateral thinking, and his books contain delightful examples. Well, here's a beauty you might like to add to the collection. Gyroscopes do not exhibit a new force. They show a lack of a force where there should have been one. That's why it was so hard to see, a lack of centrifugal. I see nobody on the road, said Alice. I only wish I had such eyes, said the king in a fretful tone, to be able to see nobody, and at that distance too. <laughs> Lewis Carroll must be laughing at us all. If there is a lack of a force, the rest is just pure engineering. We have not yet covered all the situations, especially the radiation one. 
But above all, never forget, beware the Jabberwock, my son. The jaws that bite, the claws that snatch. There are many heads and many claws, but what an adventure. Last winter, Eric Laithwaite built a model of a new invention out of his boyhood Meccano set. The invention had taken him 20 years to develop. When he first proposed it, he was at the height of his career and perhaps the most celebrated engineer in Britain. But the scientific establishment ostracized him because they thought the idea defied the laws of physics. Until tonight, it's been seen only by a small band of sympathizers. I've been involved in making some pretty unusual machines in my time, but even on those standards, this is a very unusual device indeed. It's a new form of propulsion that the establishment said couldn't possibly work. This is a model of something which we have now established as a possible drive even for space vehicles but nevertheless as far as the establishment is concerned this is heresy <laughs> The heart of this new machine is a gyroscope, and gyroscopes have always fascinated me. Of course, they're to do essentially with things that spin, and I think things that spin are magic, whether it be spinning electrons, spinning planets, or spinning galaxies. Sometimes I think spin is all there is, I think matter itself is nothing but spin. Certainly, with this gyroscope, I hope to develop an entirely new propulsion system. That a toy might become a new form of propulsion has sounded to most of Lathwaite's colleagues like the fantasy of a child, not an engineer. When you first see a gyroscope, it looks magical. And for some reason, he seems to have taken this childlike impression of the gyroscope. He thought it was something strange and mysterious. And if you are an innovator, as he is, the strange and mis mysterious have a great attraction. And he followed that, and he followed it too far. There you go. But for some engineers, he's a hero. Eric Lathwaite is one of the giants of electrical machine developments in the 20th century. He's a man with intense curiosity about all technical matters, uh, a burning desire to find out how things work, how things operate. He also has a desire to communicate his ideas and share his enthusiasm you get the impression that it's trying to get a grip on this magnetic flux. Lathwaite seems always to have had an enthusiasm for the strange and magical. Now it's going nicely. The linear electric motor is a very simple idea. It's just an ordinary electric motor which has been unrolled. And will produce a force... He's best known as the developer of the linear motor. We put the aluminium plate on the surface and switch on. <coughs> And the effect of the force is now quite obvious.
In the 60s, as a young professor at Imperial College, Lathwaite developed scores of applications for the linear motor. In the 70s, one was used to power a British experimental high-speed train. Lathwaite helped develop a full-scale test vehicle combining the latest hovercraft and linear motor technology. But one day, he suddenly got bad news. The tracked hovercraft company is at present in, in jeopardy, uh, and it stands a, a chance of stopping just for lack of funds. And stop it did, when the British government pulled out. But Lathwaite wasn't beaten. Switch on! He immediately proposed an even better idea for a high-speed train. Now, you see that supported height is now about six inches. And six inches is more than the height you would need to suspend a high-speed train. He made a linear motor levitate by electromagnetism. We've designed a motor to propel it, which gives you the lift and guidance for nothing, literally for nothing, for no additional equipment and for no additional power input. This is beyond my wildest dreams that I should ever see that sort of thing occur. Maglev has shown up well under test at the Railway Technical Centre. But in Britain, Lathwaite's visionary idea was only half-heartedly developed and then dropped. With all this going only to be taken up by the Japanese and Germans. It was the final disappointment. The cancellation was a terrible blow to him. He saw a major project work he had been engaged in for years, which had been building up gradually but steadily, making progress and seeming to be leading to something quite outstanding. He saw this all vanish, disappear almost overnight when the project was cancelled, and it was a terrible blow for him. Electromagnetism is, for me, the nearest thing we have to sheer magic. Two different directions of motion with one and the same set of coils. But ironically for the public, Lathwaite was rapidly becoming an engineering superstar. He tried hard to be as enthusiastic about linear motors as before, but he now knew it was a technology that in Britain had been unfulfilled. I've got a rubber model. He'd reached a dead end. But his life was about to be changed forever. One fateful day, this man phoned Lathwaite to say he had a remarkable new invention. Lathwaite invited him to Imperial College. An amateur inventor, Alex Jones, had brought Lathwaite a crude device which he said broke the laws of physics. Other scientists of Lathwaite's eminence might well have dismissed him as a crank, but Lathwaite was curious. Jones's device consisted of a weight hinged to an upright stand mounted on wheels. Just swinging the weight from side to side, said Jones, would propel the device a few feet forward, with no drive to the wheels, no external thrust. Lathwaite knew that was impossible, but Jones told him it wasn't, if the weight was a spinning gyroscope. Lathwaite vividly recalls his reaction. When Alex switched his machine on, it was quite disturbing to one's upbringing. The gyroscope appeared to be producing a force without a reaction. When you see something like that, you say, well, that shouldn't happen. And, and once you see something like that, then you hope, don't you? You've got to find out. I thought I'd seen something that was impossible. Like everyone else, I'm brought up on Newton's laws of motion. The third law is supposed to have said, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Therefore, you cannot propel a body outside its own dimensions. This thing apparently did. So Lathwaite immediately set about investigating more impossible things a gyroscope might do. I started to do experiments of my own. One of them was to make rather large spinning tops with most of their mass in the rim of the wheel. 
and these very definitely did something that looked impossible. And by 1973, uh, Sir George Porter asked me if I'd do a discourse at the Royal Institution. The Royal Institution is one of Britain's most august centres of scientific learning. It has a long tradition of inviting some of the nation's leading scientists to give a discourse about their work. The great scientist Faraday himself had been a frequent lecturer, but such was Lathwaite's standing that he too had been asked more than once to follow in his footsteps and address the cream of Britain's scientific establishment. I've given a number of discourses. Lathwaite decided to discuss his new research on gyroscopes. I was very excited about it because I knew I had something to show them that was startling. And I did it rather in the spirit of come and look what I've discovered, come and share this with me. My it was only afterwards I realised that nobody wanted to share it with me. Well, tonight, one of the His mistake was to appear to challenge the very foundations of science, even Newton himself. A gyroscope is a curious device in which conventional physics seems to go out of the window. Now, first of all, we spin up the wheel, and it's then what I call live, as opposed to when it's not spinning, dead. So what I'm going to do is to hang this large weight on, and then as it's rotating, hang on the weight, it recesses, it has angular momentum about the vertical, we catch the weight next time round, hop, and the angular momentum just simply disappears, it seems to evaporate. It makes you question the validity of the Newton's third law. Action and reaction are equal and opposite, and this is another experiment that appears to defy conventional physics. And you see, this is not doing what the physics book says it should, because the mass center is certainly not the center of rotation. And that's not what is supposed to happen. He only learnt afterwards how his audience were taking it all. There were several things in the lecture that were pure heresy. It won't go away. That is a ridiculous thing to see to say that a, a, an object can rotate in a circle and not produce the full amount of centrifugal force, the man's obviously a lunatic. And the second thing was lifting the big wheel. How do you manage to lift a 50-pound wheel with one hand? There is no way I can pick that up with one hand, not, not above there. I'm not a strong man, I don't need to weight training. But when it's spinning, it's another matter. release it and it begins to climb almost on its own no strain on my arm at all there must be some trick was what people said whereas in fact i knew that once you got this thing processing it appeared to float it did appear to lose weight and it was this idea that a gyroscope might lose weight that lathwaite developed in his last experiment one which was far too heretical for his audience and proved his final undoing so if the big wheel lost weight, the question is, will these little wheels lose weight when they're turned round and made to precess upwards, just like the big wheel? Let's try. Now each time the wheel comes down the wall, you see the needle kick back, it appears to give a lot of weight as with the big wheel. Lathwaite genuinely thought he was opening up a brand new area of research and that as Britain's most famous engineer, he would be taken seriously. You could use this lot of weight. This is certainly the most exciting experiment. I was simply trying to tell them that, look, here's something very unusual that's worth investigating. I hope I've got sufficient reputation in electrical engineering not to be written off as a crank. So when I tell you this, I hope you'll listen. But they didn't want to. I don't think we've hardly begun. After the R.I. lecture, all hell let loose, and, and primarily as a result, first of all, of an article in The New Scientist, which was followed by articles in the Daily Press, with headlines such as, Lathwaite defies Newton. And um, the press is always excited by the possibility of an anti-gravity machine, because of spaceships and science fiction. And the minute you say you can make something rise against gravity, then you've made an anti-gravity machine. And then the floodgates are unleashed on you, especially from the establishment. You've, you've now brought the, the science into disrepute, or you're apparently trying to, because you've done something which is against the run of the tide. 
Such was the hostility that the royal institution, for the only time in its history, didn't publish the discourse. As if they were trying to pretend Lathwaite had never given it, it hadn't happened. Even today, 20 years later, none of his eminent colleagues will publicly talk about that evening, or indeed, about Lathwaite himself. After the discourse that never was, Lathwaite was banished from the scientific establishment. He ought, on the basis of all the work he had done before with electrical machines, he ought to have become a member of the Fellowship of Engineering, perhaps a Fellow of the Royal Society. And I understand that he was nominated for these honours, though because of this incident, the nominations were blocked and he was never given those honours. Richard Milton is an electrical engineer and science writer who's made a special study of the phenomenon of scientific heresy. Historically, it's, uh, it seems to be almost an integral part of the, uh, of the scientific process because uh, many of the famous names of the past, heroes of science, in fact, like Faraday and the Wright brothers, people like Edison, they were all in their day ostracised and ridiculed. Um, because their contemporaries were unable to see that what they were doing was an advance in science. They perceived it as being dabbling in some kind of occult or taboo subject. There have always been eccentrics in the history of science. There have always been Eric Lathwaite, and they've always been derided and marginalised. But I think in the last 10, 20 years, the process seems to have accelerated. It's become worse and worse as science has become more institutionalised, more bureaucratic. It's become pub almost entirely publicly funded. Uh, the sort of sanctions which institutional science is able to bring to bear on the eccentric um, have multiplied. And today, if you don't toe the line, if you... Uh, and you don't have to uh, make a radically new discovery. You can be... Uh, you can be ostracized simply for thinking about it. Today, Lathwaite no longer draws the crowds. He's been marginalized, but according to most of his colleagues, for good reason. He left his own chosen subject, the field he understood, and drifted into a wonderland of mechanical engineering where his instincts didn't work. The evidence for, the output for 15 years, he'd become a figurehead of novelty, and he wanted that to continue. And that, I think, is the driving force that led him on, to do something different, something of world importance. But although the innovator, the genius, is always opposed by the dunderheads who don't understand things, even the genius must stop and say occasionally, am I a genius? Am I really doing something new? Or am I deluding myself into believing I'm a genius? And I feel that Eric fell into that second category. But despite everything, Lathwaite was convinced gyroscopes had some kind of unusual force. He searched through the records of patent applications and found scores of inventors had had the same idea some even believing gyroscopes to be the secret behind flying saucers. People like amateur inventor Sandy Kidd. Working from his garage, Kidd claimed his anti-gravity device, although it couldn't take off, did lose a pound in weight. He showed it to the one scientist he knew would take it seriously. In the 1980s, Lathwaite was still a professor at Imperial College, where he'd kept up research on gyroscopes on the side. At the time, he thought Kidd had made a real breakthrough. There can't be any doubt. I mean, there it goes. There's a whole object that goes up. Fred Scovell was another inventor consumed with the idea that gyroscopes could produce a new form of thrust unknown to physics. I feel that the establishment will not accept anything unless we've differentiated it twice. A retired government engineer, Scovell, together with Lathwaite, thought the new force would show up in the complex mathematics of the gyroscope. But the few scientists who specialize in gyroscopes soon put Lathwaite right. 
Many people have been fascinated by the behavior of spinning objects, including gyroscopes. Amongst these, of course, is Professor Lacewaite. And the suggestion has been that these phenomena do not comply with the existing classical laws of physics. This is not the case. These equations have been known for 200 years, and proper use of these will in fact predict with a very high degree of accuracy all of these so-called magic phenomena that one witnesses uh, from demonstrations like spinning wheels, being lifted easily, and apparent levitation. Indeed, when Sandy Kidd's device was independently tested and its weight properly measured, there was no levitation at all. Lathwaite almost gave up. The most depressing time was when I discovered there were no forces to be had from gyroscopes. They don't deal in force. The people who'd taken out patents, like Sandy Kidd and so on, were misguided. The mathematics said there were no forces, and that was correct. The thing that wouldn't go away was, I asked myself, can you lift a 50-pound wheel with one hand, or can't you? And is it a smooth motion, or is it not, you're not jerking it? No, it's smooth. And does the spinning top on the board not jarred about its mass centre? That's right, it doesn't. Of all the critics that I showed lifting the big wheel, none of them ever tried to explain it to me. So I decided I had to follow Faraday's example and do the experiments. And so, after retiring from Imperial College, Lathwaite started experimenting in earnest. Sussex University offered him a laboratory, and he was partnered and funded by a fellow enthusiast, engineer and inventor Bill Dawson. Standing on a weighing platform, Lathwaite again tried lifting the spinning 20-kilogram wheel. He wanted to know if his sense that the wheel had lost weight was real or imaginary. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, very good. That, that's where the original initial lift, and then that's where it feels like when it's going around the back of the neck. No doubt about the actual loss. Not about the weight loss. No, no, there. no, not at all. Not at all. Lathwaite and Dawson have spent the last three years deep in research. The first thing we're trying to find out was how we could lift a 50 pound wheel with one hand. So we set out to try to reproduce this as a hands-off experiment. And we almost reproduced the effects we had with the big wheel and we could get lift. Oh, yes. Okay, try another time. Then we tackled the problem of lack of centrifugal force. And indeed, the experiments were telling us that there was less centrifugal force than there should be. Meanwhile, of course, I was trying to do the theory, of course. I was still trying to do the mathematics. We devised more and more sophisticated experiments until, not long ago, we cracked it. Okay, camera running. Ready? Hang on. Ready? Ready. Two gyroscopes okay. precessing in tandem around a pivot. Start. For Lathwaite, this was the Eureka experiment. One, two, zero, two, three, four, five. The real breakthrough came when we realized that a precessing gyroscope could move mass through space. The spinning top showed us that all the time, but we couldn't see it. If the gyroscope does not produce the full amount of centrifugal force on its pivot in the center, then indeed you have produced mass transfer. Three squares. 38 to the half point yeah, point. Just three squares. I'll continue. Yep. 39. It was more exciting than ever now because I could then now explain the unexplainable. Gyroscopes behave absolutely in accordance with Newton's laws. We were now not challenging any sacred laws at all. We were sticking strictly to the rules that everyone would approve of, but getting the same result, a force through space without a rocket.
And later look at this. I've had this revolutionary idea for a new kind of propulsion device. Last winter, Lathwaite took to a patent lawyer an idea in Meccano for a completely new system of locomotion, mass transfer by gyroscope. And what you're trying to do is to get this wheel, as it were, from here to there by precessing, then get it back from there to there by sliding, but to do it as a continuous process. Right, but the, the crux of it is, is this precession of the gyroscope to move the mass. That's and, right. And that is a... A, a completely new discovery. As that I is what we discovered. Right. And where do you see the principal application for this device? Well, the first thought, of course, is space propulsion mm -hmm. because uh, it doesn't use a rocket. Right. But of course, if the power weight ratio was high, then there'd be all manner of other applications, if you, especially if you could make it hover like a, a helicopter without any use of air in order to do it. To be a scientific heretic really takes a lot of strength. I suppose you could say, does it matter if science ridicules and ostracizes a person who doesn't play by the rules? But I think it does matter. I think it matters to all of us because practically every major advance in technology in the last hundred years has been some kind of defiance of the rules. But this derision, this uh, perception of the research being without value, without merit, that alone can be enough to kill off promising lines of research. Um, the worrying thing about this is that when you look back at the history of science, it isn't those on the inside that produce the innovations. It's those on the outside. It's the Eric Lathwaite of this world, the people who are perceived as the eccentrics that produced inventions. But science has a dilemma. Can it really be open to everything and explore every new idea, however unlikely? On the other hand, science is about innovation, and by definition, the more innovative an idea, the more challenging to existing theories, and therefore the more unlikely. So when the innovations are so great they become heresies, before testing the strength of the new ideas, science will test the strength of the heretics themselves. The qualities you need to be a heretic, undoubtedly, tenacity, I think, is the first one. If you believe you're right, you have to have the courage to go on. You, you can't just pretend, oh, well, I, I'll, I'll play to their tune and, and I'll, I'll get what honours are coming to me because I, I did linear motors and so I'll be satisfied with that. It wasn't like that. It was rather like the white rabbit in Alice in Wonderland. If you've seen a white rabbit take a watch out of its pocket, you're going to follow it. It's only pretending it's otherwise. I'd have done this anyway, whether I'd been, had a reputation in engineering or not. It was the curiosity that took me. Well, now, of course, it's got serious. Whether a heretic is a visionary or a crank is ultimately for science to decide. But has it got the balance right? Should persecution ever be the price of innovation? Why should people reject the idea of something new? Well, of course, they always have. You go back to Galileo, they were going to put him to death for not saying the Earth was the centre of the universe. I'm reminded of something Mark Twain once said, a crank is a crank only until he's been proved correct. So now, I myself have demonstrated that I've been correct all along. Anyone seeing the experiments would know at once, if they knew their physics, that I've done what I said I can do and that I'm no longer a heretic. It's a flat earth snake, people. A flat earth snake. <laughs> uh, it's a vine snake. A vine snake.